You guys are going to have to put up with some of the teacher in me. Um, I'm going to need you to be a little extra quiet tonight because my voice is a little extra quiet because my breathing is not where it needs to be thanks to asthma. So, But I'm real excited about talking to you about Galatians. Um, and I'd just like to pray before we get started. Father God, we come before you with open hearts and open minds. Father, you gave us your word to teach us, to guide us. Your word is how we know who you are and who we are. And we know what to do and how to do it and when to do it and where to do it. Everything about your word, Father God, is so that we can know. We just thank you, Father, for this blessing of your word. We ask that what I speak tonight is what you want these ladies to hear about the book of Galatians. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, and I pray that I am your vessel. We offer you this evening, Father God. Amen. Um, as a teacher, uh, I'm well aware of the importance of being in the know in this position in order to impart anything worthwhile to those who are listening. So I have read Galatians, I can't even count how many times now, um, and every time I get a little something different, every time a little something else comes to focus, but there's one key word, and that's the word no, K-N-O-W, not N-O. And through the book of Galatians, Paul is writing this to churches that we learned back last spring when we did Acts. Actually, it might have been last fall. Um, when he went out and he went to these churches, and he told them about Jesus, and he told them the gospel. And then uh, later on in Acts, he backtracked through these very same churches, and he told them then that you must encourage each other, and you must be encouraged in the faith. He says, because there will be many tribulations. And now he's writing this letter, and one of the first things that he says to them after he greets them with grace and peace, as he always does, is in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I am astonished. Some verses have some more powerful words than that, some ver um, versions. But I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting. Him who called you in the grace of Christ. The church in Galatia had very quickly allowed Jewish Christians to come in and start telling them, you got to do things differently. And they were like, oh, we do? Oh, okay. And that was totally off course. That was not what Jesus had said. That was not what Paul had said. But they jumped right on board and said, oh, okay, we'll go that way. And that's where my first point comes in, in the term, in know, you need to know where your information comes from, and you need to know your information. And we can apply that to bazillion applications in our world today. I teach teenagers. You wouldn't believe some of the nonsense that they tell me 
I heard this. I read this. Somebody told me this. And I'm like, and it's a load of straw coming out of the It's not worth anything because it's not valid information and you don't have a valid source. But ladies, we have the most valid source ever in the Word of God. So we need to know our Word of God. And we need to know that it comes from the one and only true and living God. When we know who wrote it and what it says, there ain't no stopping us. We need to know the Word of God. And Paul, one thing I did like about chapter 1, um, after he gets on them for straying and following the wrong gospel, or it's not really the wrong gospel. I mean, technically, yes, we could go that way. But it was just a twisted gospel. Can anybody think of another time where we were told of a story where somebody twisted God's word and caused a heck of a problem? I'm thinking like in the garden, right at the very, very beginning. Okay? So that it's not necessarily... A, a different or a wrong, it's just been twisted. But what I like about Paul in that um, I've got some background being an English teacher and I had to teach persuasive essay writing, and one of the big things is you need to let your audience know why in God's name should they listen to you? Who are you and who are you to tell me anything? And Paul tells them, he says, the gospel that I'm bringing to you, that I brought to you, I didn't write it, and I didn't learn it from any human being. I didn't read it out of a book. God himself revealed this to me. I'm not giving you some man-made cockamamie story here. I am giving you the holy word of God that he knocked me off a horse on my keister, made me blind for three days, and he told me. He told me this. And then he goes on and he recounts his history, which we're all well aware of, that he was the chief of persecutors of the Christian church. He was out to get anybody and everybody. And he was an extremely knowledgeable Pharisee. If he was in my class, he would be the A-plus student. He'd be the APIB kid that's got the 5.0 GPA, because you can get those now. You couldn't get those when I was a kid. He was that kid. He was the shooting above the mark every single time. He knew everything that these twisters knew. But that's not what he preached. He preached the word of God. And I like that, that, that he said that. He said what his credibility was. This is why you need to listen to me and not them. Okay? Because they're talking as men, and I am talking to you with the word straight from God, okay? Um, the other thing that he did between chapters 1 and chapter 2 was he went away. When he got the word from God, he went away kind of to study, make sure. We don't really know. But he went away for three years, came back, talked to Peter for 15 days, then he went off to Syria and Cilicia, where they didn't know who he was. Now, I just got done reminding you that he was the chief persecutor in common Jewish territory. Everybody knew him. 
Can you imagine if this guy had been the guy that was knocking off all your friends? Are you going to want to go listen to him? Okay, I'm not going to listen to him. I know me. So he went somewhere where nobody knew who he was. They didn't know his past. And he was preaching. And I think my speculation, after reading through some of this and what some of his subsequent verses, I think he was trying to kind of just get his feet wet in unbiased territory. Nobody knew him. Nobody knew his message. He was going to give it a go and see what happened. And it was amazing. It was awesome. Because as we all know, the word of the Lord never returns void. Okay? It doesn't matter how green you are. It doesn't matter how shaky you are. It doesn't matter any of that. If it's the word of the Lord, it's going to work. And it worked. So he came back, but it was 14 years before he came back. And then he went to go see the apostles. And he went to go see a select few. And he said, guys, I kind of want to run this by you. This is what I've been doing. But you guys were with him. You were his team. I'm kind of the second string I want to run this by you and make sure that I'm on the mark. He says, I want to make sure that I'm not doing it wrong. And he told them what he was preaching. And they recognized that it was a little bit different than what they had been given. But they recognized that he had a different audience. The apostles were addressing the Jewish nation, Jewish culture, the Jewish people. Paul was hitting the Gentiles. So there was a slight difference, and not a word was said against his preaching and the way he was going about it. And so then he gets this church in Galatia that is letting the Jewish Christian uppy-ups tell them they're wrong. He basically was saying, if you're going to follow Christ, in order to follow Christ, if you're a Gentile and you want to follow Christ, you got to hit this middle stepping stone and become a Jew first. Then you can do this. But that was not the message that God had given to Paul. God told Paul, no, they can bypass that little nugget right there because that's a special group. They were born into that. They were raised in that. These folks, are, they don't have to go down that road. They get to bypass. And that's where we are. We don't have to go down that road either. We do not have to go become Jewish in culture, in faith, in thought. We don't need to do that in order to come to Christ. We can just go directly there. Um, And that is comes to my second, you got to know. The second got to know is you got to know who you are. And you got to know whose you are. Paul reminded the people, I lost my spot. It's on this page. He said, and I thought this was really interesting, his insight. He says to them that before he was born, and we, we know this from um, Psalm 139, says, My frame, O Lord, was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Before your mom or your dad had any clue you were going to be in existence, God knew. And he knew everything about you. Stop and think about that for a minute. Before any human being ever considered that you might be in existence, God already knew you. Inside out, upside down, backwards and forwards. Every nook and cranny, every wish, every hope, every desire. 
every thought, everything about you. God already knew it. And Paul tells them, God already knew I was going to be a jerk. God already knew I was going to go kill a bunch of Christians. God already knew I was going to get raised and taught in the Jewish traditions and be one of the smartest in the bunch. But he also knew my heart. And that if he knocked me off a horse on my keister and made me blind for three days, that I would recognize that I was being a jerk and I would change what I was doing. And God already knew that about me. Do you not think that he knows you and he loves you with all of the cruddy things that any one of us have done. It may not quite be on the level of Paul. But for some of us, it may come a little closer than we'd like it to. But when you stop and you consider that God already knew that. And he made you anyway. And he loves you anyway. What a fantastic God we serve. So you got to know who you are and whose you are. Also in chapter 2 and then partially into chapter 3, Paul also talks about the fact that they were being told to follow the law. And there was a comment that I read on all of this that I hadn't actually thought about um, because we don't ascribe to old Jewish law traditions with save maybe the Ten Commandments, the first biggies and the only ones that God gave because the other... some odd do's or don'ts and 300 some odd do's in what the Jewish leaders added to the Ten Commandments. Okay? We don't, we've never, I've never read any of them. I don't know them. Don't care to know them. But that wasn't my culture either. It wasn't the Gentile culture. That was only Jewish culture. And before Christ, that was all they had to try to make themselves better in order to be accepted by God. And then Christ came. Christ fulfilled the need for the redemption and salvation. All of that law was not necessary any longer for the Jewish people. Gentiles never had it in the first place. And that's us too. So these Christian Pharisees, Jewish uppy ups, I guess probably not the Pharisees, the Jewish Christians that were powerful were coming in and saying, you got to do Jewish stuff in order to become a Christian. And the Gentiles were like, well, what was all that? So they start spilling it out. And I was like, no, wrong avenue. You don't need to go down that road. You simply need to believe in Jesus Christ because we are justified by our faith, not by our works. It is only by our faith that justifies us. Classic, the best example of that in, of all time in my book is the thief on the cross. Tell me, how many commandments did he follow? How many of those do's and don'ts 
did he really follow? I don't think he had very many on the good side. And I think he knew that. And I don't think he was able to get down off that cross and go make it all good. Yeah. But Christ said, today you will be with me in paradise. Because you believed today it all comes good. You don't have to do anything. Now, do we do good stuff? You betcha we do. On the flip side, we don't work for our faith. We work because of our faith. The faith has to come first. If the faith doesn't come first, all the great, fantastic, amazing, awesome, good works you do, they don't really amount to anything except a lot of good works. A lot of good pats on the back. A lot of good high fives. Thumbs ups. But when you've got the faith, then the works have power. Because this is the power. The works themselves, they don't have any power. But God's got the power. So the faith comes first. The works will follow. One of my favorite songs, and it's in a little teeny weeny one, and if I'd have thought about it, I'd have gotten it so we could listen to it, but it's an old song by um, Rich Mullins. Does anybody know Screen Door on a Submarine? The chorus line says, faith without works is like a song you can't sing, and it's about as useless as a screen door on a submarine. But catch the order. Faith first, then the works. It doesn't say works without faith or works with faith. Either way, you got to have the faith, and then you get the works. And that's the third no. You need to know what's expected of you. As Gentiles, what is not expected of us is following all of the law. As post-Christ Christians... All that is expected of us primarily is faith. And when you've got that faith, the works will follow. The works will follow. And that's what's expected. And we need to know the rules. Again, as a school teacher, the first like week of school, we didn't hardly do any school. All we do is review policies and procedures. This is how the system works. These are the rules that we follow. These are the reasons that we follow the rules. That's what we need to know. We've got to know what the rules are and how to correctly follow them. Not misinterpret them. Not taking direction from the wrong boss. Know the right rules, know how to follow them, know what is expected of you. Okay, on your table, you've got some questions that kind of tag on to that with regards to different Gospels, alternative Gospels, twisted Gospels. Question about my favorite one. The depth of the thought that God knew you before anything. And he knew everything about you. Everything. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Everything. And he still loved you. And he still and he still and he still gave you a purpose. And he's made you awesome. 
and then to know what you need to do the way God asked you to do it.